Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here with my wife, Marion. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are dropping in. Uh, we decided not to shoot in the office today, so we're shooting in one of the other rooms of the house. Uh, it's a little awkward for us. We've never shot here before, but uh, we wanted a little bit uh, more space to operate so we weren't squeezed in yeah. trying to fit <laughs> into the frame. Uh, as I told you guys when I was shooting the uh, video this morning about mental health, that Marion and I were gonna come back and talk to you guys about the importance of a whole nuclear family model uh, as a part of rebuilding the black community. Uh, I've written about it in multiple books. If you guys have read Miseducation of Black Youth in America, if you've read Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, you've seen where I put great emphasis on uh, the importance of the holistic family of the black uh, family nucleus and where we've gone since 1960 where 75% of black youth were born into two-parent households to where now we're at roughly 72% being born in single-parent households and that's exacerbated by the fact that not only are we dealing with primarily uh, female heads of household we're dealing with inactive or absentee fathers that not only are not in the home but not directly engaged uh i don't before i before i crank up this conversation i want to be clear as a black man who does everything he can to be active in his children's lives i don't want to send out the message that there aren't black men out there right. handling their business that isn't what this is about we're talking about the far too many children who don't have a father who is present, whether they're in the home or not. Right. And I think it's important that we understand with the dynamic, the social dynamic and home dynamic that we've created, we're going to have to be creative in how we remedy this situation because now we have a bunch of single mothers who are parenting uh, at home and a lot of times trying to be provider, nurturer, disciplinarian, mm -hmm. and all of those things, when she's equipped naturally to do some of those things, right. but not all, it creates all types of uh, issues with functionality, dysfunction, uh, and problems in development for the child, as well as stress and depression, right. and so many other uh, elements and components for the, for the, uh, for the woman. What we want to do is we want to talk about the importance as we see it and why we're so passionate about it. But we want to talk about it from the perspective of what we're noticing in our culture now by way of how it's impacting our women and the negative impact it's ha having on our children. Right. Uh, Marion, you work with girls. You also have uh, friends with uh, girls who are dealing with certain issues with you know, having babies and not having a father present or having someone present that's not a positive role model or in, in worst case scenarios, we've seen uh, situations uh, one way or another, whether we observe it uh, through news, for, through the news, through posts, uh, through people sharing their stories with us where you got men or young, young males uh, being violent. Right. And so uh, all of that comes from the lack of proper socialization and development within the home in the early years. Mm -hmm. That's what the nuclear family is for. It's an institution. And if we don't see it as an institution, we miss our opportunity. The family is not simply uh, an environment. It's an institution. It's an institution where you teach values. Right. It's an institution where you instill principles. It's an institution that by the time a child is seven years old, they have a clear understanding of where they're going in life and what life will offer them and what they are capable of doing. But when you don't do it properly, right. you send a confused child out into a world that is designed to make their life a living hell. So Marion, I mean, you've worked a lot, especially with girls, but you've reared some boys, right. so you know it from almost every angle. When mm -hmm. we, when you, when we're sitting up and talking, and you're looking at what we see, right? Uh, I mean, what is one of the first things that comes to mind when you think of the family? Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me, dealing with it personally, having experienced in it, is 
our children are growing up with abandonment issues. I say this word a lot, and I think a lot of people just kind of let it roll off their back. Like, they're not really getting it. When a child or have abandonment issues, they don't um, develop um, emotionally well. And so they may attach themselves to some things that are not good for them because they don't want to feel alone. Or they may detach from everyone because they don't ever want to feel the pain of their father leaving again. So it doesn't create healthy, productive youth when they feel abandoned. They don't feel good enough. And so they're always searching for something to fill that void inside of them. And that's that absentee parent. It goes so much deeper than the mother and the father um, co-parenting. It goes so much further than that because of the the male or the female child needs to have both roles playing that part effectively and efficiently. And so that's how they're, like you say, socialized. They're socialized to know how to handle a young lady or, you know, for the, for the, the, general, the boy to handle a young lady and for the young lady to handle another boy because they see that interaction between mother and father. So it's, it's, it's more than what we think. And it, it kills me that some of us women think we don't need that masculine energy around. We honestly believe it's not going to affect our children, but guess what? It is affecting our children. It's affecting our children a great deal. And I wanna let you talk more about how it's affecting our children uh, okay. for, for young men. Okay, what you have to understand is we talk a lot in the scope of our development of understanding of the cosmic world. We talk a lot about vibrational energy. We talk a lot about vibration. We talk a lot about energy. Energy in the scope of spirituality. But I don't think we really too, truly get an understanding of just how important it is uh, in the development of children. Uh, when a child is first born, the first thing they perceive is energy. Before they can communicate verbally or audibly, before they can understand language, they are reading energy. That's why you can have a child that you pass off to a certain person. Uh, Marion's trying to get some things together, so don't worry about it. Uh, you have a child you pass off to a certain uh, individual, and that child automatically starts crying. Well, of course, uh, what it is is they're sensing energy. From a, from, I mean, from the time and per point they are first born. Uh, of course, all of this would start uh, right when we are getting ready to do this. Uh, one of the lights went out, but don't worry about that. We still are going to be okay. We're going to okay. turn that right there, and we're going to keep it moving. <laughs> okay. Because it's just one of those things. <laughs> of course it would happen uh, on the first time we do this. Somebody rings the doorbell and try to sell us something. I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but what I want to get you to understand is, so you've got this energy thing. Well, what actually happens in a holistic home where the nuclear family is in place is there's a certain level of masculine energy that comes from the, the man. There's a certain level of feminine energy that comes from the woman. And then what happens is as they merge to accomplish unique and specific goals together, their energy sinks. Mm -hmm. This is what you've heard when you hear the word synergy. It's the sinking of energy to achieve something greater than anything that the two individuals could have achieved on their own. Right. So you come together to achieve these. One of the things that you achieve that you cannot achieve on your own, male or female, is the holistic preparation of your progeny to go out into the world and compete and win in a world that is inherently hostile towards them. So when you have an absence of the masculine energy, mm -hmm. or in some cases an absence of the feminine energy, then you have an absence of a part of the process that initiates the development of the child. Right. Before the child ever hears a word spoken that they understand, they sense energy. They sense energy, they, 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 they respond to energy. That's why you can get some people that can pick up a baby they don't know and the baby just sinks into them right. and just starts smiling. It's the energy they're emitting and that's the only communicative thing that the baby has to know if it's in a proper and supportive and comforting and safe environment. Correct. And so that's why you get babies that cry a lot. They don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and they can sense hostility. You ever seen you you start arguing, the baby start crying? Mm -hmm. It's the energy. So we're talking before we ever get to the point where we're verbally teaching and modeling. Mm -hmm. We don't have a property proper energy environment or spiritual environment mm -hmm. that encapsulates the child, creates a safe uh, space for the child and opens the child up to be taught, to be guided, to be led, to be prepared. Then you get into the point that there are just certain things that women are better teaching than men. Right. Women are better at educating the children. Men are better at preparing the children. Two totally different things. I know it sounds the same, but not. mothers educate and nurture. Fathers prepare and discipline. Right. Two totally different things, two totally different realms. It comes from a natural place. When the mother disciplines, she disciplines out of order. And when I say out of order, I mean out of natural order. Right. And it sends a different energy. And it withdraws her from her natural ability to nurture. Right. I remember growing up and being reared by my great grandparents. And I remember my grandfather going to my grandmother when I was about eight years old and telling my grandmother from this point on, I got him. You don't discipline him. You don't put your hands on him. You don't whoop him. I didn't understand what was going on at the time, but this is a man that has a second grade education. He didn't study psychology for year on year on year like I right. did. He don't have, he didn't have any psychology degrees or anything like that. He just simply understood what it meant to be a man and when it was time to take the control and the reins. And what he told me when I got old enough to ask him, why did you stop her from physically disciplining me or verbally dominating me? Mm -hmm. He said, because if she continued to physically dominate you and verbally dominate you, you would get used to being dominated by a woman and you would look for a woman that would dominate you and you would never be a man and able to lead. He says, right. you need at a certain time to step from underneath that apron mm -hmm. and step out and be led by a man so that you can understand what a man does, how a man handles pressure, mm -hmm. how a man treats his wife, even when they're not on the same page, right. how a man steps up and is willing to put everything first. He, he told me, he said, being the head is not being at the top. Right. He said being the head is being at the bottom. Why? Because the head is the foundation on which everything else is built. You're not on the top. You're last and you're at the bottom. And you have to understand that if you're always out front and you're trying to be at the top, mm -hmm. you're more worried about the glory than you are the importance of building a strong family and foundation where your wife is secure and your children feel safe. And so I learned that. And then I just started to understand it more as I developed an understanding of human behavior. So would you say that could be part of the problem with male and female relationship wise? Like That's for, a huge a male, part. for a male to not be raised in a home with another man, to not have that, you know, example. Can, can you say that's what one of our biggest problems would be on how he deals with women? Yeah, if he's never had a man to show him how to interact with women, He's had a primary influence of females. Okay. So he's going to respond to conflict Different. as a female would. Bam. So then That's why women, we're getting these men that are, we call them weak. But they don't know any other way to be because they have never had a man model manhood in front of them. So they act just like us because guess what? They were raised by us and alone. So we have to understand the detriment that we're causing our children when there is not a masculine energy at home. And I'm not saying all women that are single don't do an exceptional job with raising their kids because some kids get beyond all of this. But we're here for the majority. The right. kids what, that what, are what, not what I think, beyond. What I think that we have to do is we have to define what success is. And I think that we allow society to define what success is to the point that we think we've done a great job right. when really and truly we haven't. So we define success. If our son is, we're talking specifically about son, but this mm -hmm. impacts the daughter as well. Right. And we'll get into that. But if my son gets out, he gets a six figure job. Right. Then he holds successful. down a job. He, he buys a home. He takes care of mommy. He right. gets a wife. He takes care of his kids. He pays his bills. Mm -hmm. Then he's a great man. Mm -hmm. Well, well that is success based on that. How he deals influential with his, is right. he in the home? Yeah, how he deals with his wife, how, how he, he deals with his children. That That's what we really should be focusing on by saying, oh, that's a successful man if you, or a woman. It's how they deal with the people that they, they are the closest to.
when you put a man in a house, it's not how much money he brings into the house. It's not how many degrees he has on his wall. It's not the business he owns. It's not the friends that he have around him that gives him status. At the end of the day, it's the understanding of the level of a commitment that he has to his wife and to his progeny, his children right. and his offspring. And so what happens is when he understands that and he fully engages it and he's committed to it, he'll find a way to get the money. Right. He'll find a way to elevate himself so that he can be everything that his family needs. But if he doesn't know who he is, if he brought up and he's been told that if he's been commodified. Right. That's to, happening. If he's been commodified to the point that the only value he sees in himself is how many figures are on that check when he gets paid, right. he's going to get lost because at some point in life, that's going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. At some point in life, you're going to get laid off. At some right. point in life, you're going to have to take a lower paying job in order to open up your possibilities to move further on. Sometimes you got to go backwards right. in order to move ahead. And if all he has is I in, the, in this position, I am senior vice president of, right. and I make X amount of dollars a week, a month, a year, and then this is what I do. I can buy my wife this. I can take her that. What happens when you can't? Yeah. How much of a liability do you become to your family in the moments where the things that you hang your hat on are no longer present? When you have a man who knows who he is, who was reared by a man who knows who he is, he gets in those tight schedules, but he never gets shaken. Mm -hmm. He never lets his energy cause his family to be shaken. He has a calmness about himself because he's confident in himself, not in his job. Mm -hmm. Now, if he has anything outside of himself that, he's, that he has confidence in, it's God. But see, if he thinks like me, God is inside. So that even that is not something on the outside. God is within. But whatever happens, there's no hanging his hat on his money, hanging his hat on his car, hanging his hat on how big of a house he is. Then he has to deal with that inner man. Right. That hasn't matured because he never had the modeling. That's why it's extremely important for us to realize that we do need both parents in the home. And if for whatever reason we realize... You know, some people we just can't live with. Some people we can't stay married to. We get that part. But I, I think the part, the, the most important part of this video is for us to acknowledge how important it is for us to have um, dual parenting and to have the male and the female energy in the home so we can uh, model correctly. Uh, but we need to also realize that we have to hold ourselves accountable as well because I can't go have a baby by Ray Ray down the street if Ray, for, if Ray Ray has five other baby mamas and think he's going to be around for mine. So then that means I'm not thinking correctly or I'm not holding myself up to a higher standard to, to require more. So that's where a lot of this is coming in at. It's, it's lack of self-control because sometimes we just, we got to have sexual gratification or we got to have that self-gratification right then. Forget waiting. And so that's where we're messing up. We're creating children with people we don't even like. I mean, let's be real. If people are on the line now, how many people can honestly say they don't like they, their baby mother or baby father? They can't stand them. Why are, we, why are we having children with these people? Why can't we slow down long enough, protect ourselves, and not bring children into a world of uncertainty? That goes back to the initial statement about the importance of a holistic family. Because when you have, now we're back to the female. Right. Because we're asking why females are picking these dudes. Well, mm -hmm. that goes back. If you don't have a holistic home where the father is present. Yes. Because see, the father is the sense of identity in the home. Mm -hmm. The mother is the sense of love. The father is a sense of identity. People say, well, I act just like my mom. mom I'm, you know, mom, I'm not talking about who you identify with. Right. I'm talking about the sense of identity. When I'm, I'll give you a prime example. My oldest will be 35 this year. In a couple of months, my oldest will be 35. My youngest is six. All of my baby girls, when they got old enough to hold a conversation with me, and I mean barely hold a conversation, it was, who's the most beautiful girl in the world? And it was, I am daddy. And I said, who, what can you do if you put your mind to it? I can do anything. The sky's the limit. And I mean, I still do it with them. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it set the stage. By the time a little boy comes along and says, yeah. you're cute. It's not going to be nothing to me. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> you are smart. Tell yeah. me something I don't. My daddy right. told me I was smart. 
My daddy told me I was beautiful. Right. My daddy told me I could do anything I set my mind to. And that is the and, and that is the honest of it. So, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I, I, you know, I'm not patting my. I'm telling you that that's so important that the father instills in the daughter who she is and what. She, now she's also going to do something else. She's going to find something real close to daddy if daddy is prominent. Oh, now this is major. Prominent in her life. Right. But 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 this is what most people don't get. She'll go find daddy if daddy ain't there either. Right. If daddy ain't there, she'll find a dude that won't be there. Right. She'll find a dude that will impregnate her and bounce. Yeah. It's amazing how this sculpts it because daddy tells baby girl her value and her worth right. by how much he invests in her. Right. How much time is he giving her? You got some fathers in the home that are just as horrible and terrible and influential as right. the ones that are absent. Right. What are you doing while you're there? Mm -hmm. How much are you showing them that you love? My grandfather didn't say I love you a lot, but I'd be doggone if I didn't look up every time you turned around and he was showing it. Was showing then it. when he got old, when I got older and he, we started relating more man on man, mm -hmm. it was, I love you, kid. I love you, son. Right. And then I got it. But at first, you know, I was like, man, the dude hard. But what he was doing is he was showing me something, but it was never nothing I asked him for or needed and that he didn't handle. Right. Now, so, in essence, what we're getting back to the, the girls, girls are gravitating towards, towards what they experienced in life around manhood. Right. Either the they dad did. was there and loved them and they're gravitating towards that. Raven. Right. Raven, when she was in the ninth grade, my, my 28 year old, when she was in the ninth grade, uh, one of my sisters told me, I think Raven's gay. And this isn't a bash on gay. Gay, 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 gay people at all. This is just some a conversation that was had. And Raven is a child that you ad adopted. Right. Let's clear that up. Right. Okay. So uh, Raven, uh, you know, uh, was doing her thing. She was living with me, um, and my sister said, "I think that uh, I think she's gay." And I'm like, "Why?" He says, because she never talked, she never, she's in the ninth grade, she's never talking about boys, you know, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't think she's gay, but why don't you go ask her why she's the way she is? And Raven's response to my sister was real succinct, and it really set a stage for just letting me know how influential I was. She says, I like boys. I, I, I like, I've been liking boys since the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. She says, but until I find one that treats me like my daddy, mm -hmm. I'm good. Right. And, you know, doesn't mean it always turns out perfect. Right. But what it was is she had an idea of what she was expecting by the way I treated her. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with any other child. It's like, hey. I expect to be treated a certain way because my daddy treated me a certain way. I also watched how my daddy treated my mom. And with my older daughters, they watched how I treated their mom even after I was gone. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I handled their moms, the way that I presented and handled everything from the conflict to everything else. I okay, well, let's go back to Raven. Um, your sister having a question about Raven possibly liking girls. What if that would have been a scenario? How does that tie into not having a father? We just talked about this. I mean, a lot of times that you start talking about that, especially when it comes to girls, is that there's a level of affection that comes from a father. That's the first time a girl feels love from a man. Mm -hmm. And so the father's affectionate, the father is loving. That's the first time she hears I love you from a man. That's the first right. time she's held by a man and all of that. The problem is, if the father is completely absent, she never experiences it from a man. Guess who she experiences it from? She experiences it from her mom. So now she becomes more comfortable with receiving affections and compliments. From and a woman. From a woman. But not and only that. Let's go back, because I've worked with teenage girls that... Um, in the juvenile justice systems that has developed a homosexual lifestyle and we're not frowning on it or anything. I love those girls like they were my own. But what I've noticed is that most of those young girls that do decide to take on being a, a lesbian, homosexual, whatever you want to call it, what I'm finding out is that because there's no father in the home and then the mother's trying to put best forth effort of working, she's never home, she's always gone, 
some of those girls have to take on a masculine energy to protect their siblings. That's what's happening. And so it's almost like they're being thrown into this world of sexuality because they don't really understand it. You got to understand and all of this. they're taking on roles that they shouldn't be responsible for. All of this is happening. And I, I don't want it to get into a clinic about that, but right. it's so important because it's becoming so prevalent. What you have to understand is you got several developmental stages. You've got from birth to seven years old. That's your theta stage. That's the stage when a child is like a sponge. They're soaking up everything right. and they're creating what's known as norms and standards. They're creating the paradigms through which they will live life. Right. And that's what they're gonna do. The second stage is more mental development along with physical development. Mm -hmm. Through this stage, they're gonna experience bodily changes, uh, different desires, hormonal shifts. Mm -hmm. And in that part, if they're going through conflict in, in, that is in opposition of the natural order of life as quote unquote, we most see it, mm -hmm. then that's gonna create confusion. Right. They're gonna become confused. They're gonna become frustrated. And there's also gonna be a hatred for young girls, especially for males. So then you got, yeah. and then most of the time in this environment, if mom is trying to get with a dude, he ain't doing right. Yeah. So then they picture in this and they're going like, this is some bull crap. Yeah, no men are any, they're not any good. That's where there's all, no good all, black men out there. All right. And then we must actually talk about this. And this goes for male and female. Right. And the LGBTQ community gets so upset at me when I talk about this. But I've been doing this for two decades plus. And I've done the studies. I've done the actual clinical engagements with these kids. We're talking about especially young males and females. And, and I, I got a friend from high school who's gay. And we talk about this a lot. And for two people who sit on two sides of the spectrum, we agree almost on every freaking thing. Right. And it's crazy that you can have that. But we'll, what we do is we put our feelings aside and we deal with objectivity. And the thing is this. I'm talking high 80s to 90% of these babies have been molested. Let's talk about it. 80 to 90% of these babies have been molested. Every, and, and I, uh, even today, I started counseling uh, people from the homosexual community, the gay community, about 12 years ago uh, as a part of a program. I haven't met a black, now I, I, I'm specifically, I'm being specific because when you're talking studies and empirical data, it's important. I haven't met a black person yet that came to me because they were frustrated with what was going on and they were confused that hadn't been molested. Many of them had blocked it out. Right. And it took some time of peeling back the layers mm -hmm. of their life and moving backwards, which is one of the things I do with, with people who are struggling is I start where you're at and we move backwards right. slowly. It's and the more we move backwards, the better, the more trust I build with you to gain an understanding of who you are. The more you trust me, the more you talk. And then we get back, by the time we get back to where it happened, mm -hmm. you opened up a whole place that you hadn't opened up in why? Because right. you didn't trust anybody. Right. And it's there. And it's something we've got to deal with. But the problem is when you got one person in the home, she can't protect those she babies. Can't do everything. She, she can drop them off and hope the people she'll dropping them off with is going to look after them. But it's so many times it's that that secondary, that secondary caregiver is either hurting them or exposing them to the one that's hurting them. Right. That's the elephant in the room that I've talked about in Born in Captivity. Mm -hmm. It is one of the biggest elephants in the room that we have because we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to pretend. We don't want to pretend. We don't talk about stuff like that. We don't want to pretend. You, you know how I, growing up in a black, black, black neighborhood in poverty, you want to know how many people lived in my neighborhood alone that girls were giving babies to their brothers and their son, no, not two different people. That same kid was their brother and their son, meaning their daddy was molesting them. Right. You know how many we had in just my time around my age growing up to the point that it wasn't viewed abnormal and nobody in the damn neighborhood was saying anything They're about saying it. Nothing. How many, how many of us got this uncle? That when we're at the family reunion, everybody's talking about don't let the bank, don't let them babies get around uncle. That don't let those girls go around uncle so and so with them shorts on. Mm -hmm. Don't let how many of us are dealing.
this is way more prevalent in our community than we want to admit. Right. We, we love to talk about the perversion of white people and they are sick beyond beyond what you can match. But we got some things we need to, we deal, need with to deal with in inside. Homes, yeah. And it's real difficult to do when you don't have a holistic family. When you don't have, and I understand that we live in a world where black men are underemployed and unemployed at a higher rate than women. Our women as a whole earn more than our men. They earn a living more, right. they're, they're employed at a higher percentage. And so it's hard for a man to take on that role, but it's got to be worked out with the two people that we don't create progeny that we cannot take care of and we're not committed to being joint in our unity and desires to provide for these kids, not just monetarily and materially, mm -hmm. but emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually mm -hmm. to help their development. It's absolutely imperative that we protect these babies, right. that we prepare them, that we get them to seven years old without them having experienced massive trauma mm -hmm. so they can develop an idea of themselves, have a self-concept and a self-image that allows them to thrive and believe in themselves. So many get to that point. And you know what a lot of parents are doing? Snatching the imagination right out of them and telling them, you, you need to get your head out of the clouds. Yeah. You're never going to be able to do that. You're not being realistic. All these things. My thing is, that needs to be, and that's the other reason why you normally have a masculine energy and a feminine energy. The feminine energy is mostly always going to lead toward the side, side of security and stability. The masculine energy by nature is willing to take risk. Why? I got to take a risk to be willing to take, uh, protect my family. If I ain't willing to put my life on the line to protect my family, I can't protect them because the moment my life becomes threatened, I push them out there. Yeah. But if I'm going to, so I might be the risk taker. But what happens is if the child grows up with a risk taker and somebody that has a stable uh, a point of view that's about, okay, you don't, you, it's okay to get out there a little bit, but don't run, jump off the cliff and, and kill yourself. And that, that goes financially, that goes emotionally, that goes relationship-wise, mm -hmm. all of that. They get a balance. They get, okay, I'm not going to go out here and blow my money or I'm not going to go out here and not have a job and just do whatever but I'm not going to sit up and just be in a dead end situation the rest of my life. Right. I'm going to strive for something, but I'm going to do it in the best way with the least amount of risk. And you get, and, and you get something out of that in life. You, number one is if you can get that mindset, you're never sitting there thinking you're okay. You're always knowing there's something better for me and you're striving for it. But that's got to be taught before seven. Yeah. That's got to be taught before seven. We right now have a problem as a collective. When it comes to black group of economics, when it comes to consumerism, right. when it comes to materialism, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, po political impotency and business ownership, mm -hmm. we have a problem in all of that. And we are trying to preach to 25 and 30 year olds right. that have 20 years of being taught the wrong way and developing right. a mindset. You're doing it wrong. Well, they're going to defend what they've been doing because their sanity is anchored it in is. their beliefs. Yep. So if do. you're trying to tell somebody in their 30s, you got to change what you're doing and their whole mindset says the way I'm important and the way I feel special in this world is if I got to buy me some Jordans every month. I've got to buy a new car every year. I don't care that that's a liability. Mm -hmm. I don't care if those Jordans depreciate the moment I buy them. I have to feel good about myself and this is the way I do it and you can't tell me anything different. You start teaching Group economics, business ownership, money management, right. before they start walking. Exactly. By the time they're seven, they already know, no, you don't buy that. That doesn't, that doesn't have any appreciative value. Right. You don't spend on that. You don't develop and accrue debt. You know how many of us are pushing our children off into college? They getting in debt. And getting in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt? Because we think that adds to our status. Let's keep it real. Who We want to be able to say, girl, my child going to, man, I just sent her off to, or I just sent him off to, and man, we paying this here. Yeah. It's in the college. You ain't paying it. 
You sitting up letting that baby accrue that darn go debt for them darn student loans. Right. And that stuff is going to come back on them. When the white kid comes home, their parents done pay for their school. Mm -hmm. When they come home, they're not getting an the apartment. They're moving back in. Until they find a wife or find a husband, get married, get married and they go, home. they gonna get seed money to, <laughs> to buy, buy the home. home. Yes. And we're wondering why we're so far behind in the in the wealth race, why the wealth gap is widening, because we're not making smart decisions, and those decisions come from how we rear our kids. Mm -hmm. It's hard to change minds of adults who've got their mind made up. Yes, Lord. And, 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 and they can be crashing. You can show them a picture of a person crashing, doing exactly what they're doing. That ain't me, though, Dad. Yeah. That ain't me. I ain't going to crash. Bam! Hey, Dad, can we talk? And then we got to fix it all. And here we go fixing it. But here's the thing, though. At least we are here as a couple to handle it. Now, imagine a mother by herself. Yep, and I was once that mother. And you're trying to work it out. And you're trying to figure it out. You're calling and you can't get dad on the phone. You can't get dad to show up. You can't get dad to play no roles. Mm -hmm. I remember having problems with my younger son. And uh, he had disciplinary problems because he was angry. He was angry because he has abandonment issues that we are currently still working through with him. He actually goes to counseling and everything. I'm only sharing this because I want to help somebody else. And so before Rick and I met, I was going through all of this drama by myself. I'm trying to save him because I see him going off a ledge and he was so young. I couldn't believe it. Mm. So I was reaching out to uncles and I was reaching out to the church and I was reaching out to the boys and girls club. And I was reaching out to what's the other organization? YMCA. All kinds of organizations. Nobody could help me. Nobody. And I remember uh, when Rick and I first started talking, I explained my situation about my son. And he, oh, man, he was like, what did you say? Ain't nobody that Nobody's bad. that, that challenge. <laughs> no, no, nobody's that but bad. But once bad. he got down here and he was able to come around and see that it was difficult. But it, it comes along with the territory of man, a woman kid. trying to do it by herself without a male present. These boys are angry. Because they don't understand why their fathers don't care enough to be around. <clears throat> and it wasn't like I was this. Now, I know it's some bitty, bitter baby mamas out there. Ladies, we got to stop being bitter. There are some bitter baby mamas out there, baby mothers, whatever you want to call them, that will not cooperate with the child's father. That wasn't I. Nope. I welcomed him because I knew they needed their interaction with their father. He wouldn't do it because guess what? Who was going to help? It was going to help me. It was going to help make it easier on me so we can raise our children together. He didn't want easy for me. He wanted struggle for me. That's another thing, lady. That's a whole other topic. There are brothers out there that will give you a baby just to see you struggle, and they will not help you. We got to get beyond and know, and know how to better choose our mates, but that's a whole other topic. But my whole point of this is, when we're having these children and these men are not around, or even there's some absentee mothers, we got to understand that that child is going to have some issues down the line. Now, some kids don't give you no problems, even though they have internal issues. They don't give you no problems until they're out the door, they're doing their own thing, and then they wonder why their relationships won't work. Their relationships don't last because they haven't had that positive modeling that they need to be socialized to interact with the, the, the other gender. That's why it's so important. And that's why we have to get it, everyone. We have to get this because other races, they figured it out. I'm not saying that they're perfect and they don't make mistakes, but they figured out the order of this thing. And the order of this thing is to do it the right way by choosing at least the best mate we can. We wait before we have children. We finish our education. We get married. We, we buy a home. And then we start to raise our children. Us on the back end, we're not doing it. And I'm not saying this every every one of us, but this the majority of us, we're not doing it right like, like that anymore. Actually, our youth are going backwards. It's popular to get pregnant and have one of those... Gender reveals. Gender reveals without the father. We're normalizing this behavior, and it's just doing this downward spiral. And guess what? We're handling, handling it. We're handing it down to the next generation. 
the next generation, the next generation. We're getting further and further behind the economic curve because we're at an economic disadvantage if we're raising all these children alone. Let's be and, real about and, that. But see, that's one side of the spectrum. Here's the other side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is even if you get together and have a child and break up, and the man is taking care of his business. He's paying child support. He's paying half of the other expenses. And he's doing all that. He shows up and everything. How hard is it going to be for two people to take care of two homes, Yeah. take care of kids, mm -hmm. and build wealth? It's going to be extremely hard. Unless you are an exceptional earner. Mm -hmm. And that's not... Our median earning as a race is 37000 Thirty-seven thousand a year mm -hmm. is our median earning. So that tells just a lot of people below the poverty line. Right. There's a lot of people right at the poverty line, and we the closer you move to six figures, the fewer the fewer of us it is. Right. And so you have to know that when you take a home that requires two people to operate it mechanically, dynamically, financially, emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. then you split that. Mm -hmm. You burden every area of your life. Right. Education, economics. Right. It's, it's, it so, it's so. so many different things that we are not paying attention to. That's so important. And, and, and this comes from, we're, we're two people uh, that are passionate about what we're passionate about because of our backgrounds. I don't ever even claim to have had the childhood that my wife had. My wife is an unbelievable representation of what the commitment to healing is. You know, she survived being molested at five, survived being raped at 14, survived being raped again, all before she becomes an adult. The person that should have been protecting her did not. And I actually met her because she came to me and she wanted to work on some things. And we had a professional relationship for a while. And then we split, she went her way to do her thing. She ended up writing this unbelievable book, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughter. Some of you have read it and you have come back and said it really blessed you. Uh, that's where the program we have now, Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters comes from. Right. But she refused to stay where she was, but she knows what that looks like. Me, on the other hand, I had these unbelievable, awesome grandparents, great-grandparents. My grandmother's parents reared me. But I'm going to tell you something. This is how powerful it is, and this is why I'm so passionate about black men Lee. I never met my father. He was within an arm's reach. I met my grandmother, his mother. I met a couple of my aunts and, and uncles. But every time I was supposed to meet him, that meeting would be set up, and he wouldn't show up. The first time I met my father, I didn't meet him. I saw him. And it was at his funeral. No, his wake. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw my father was in a casket. The second time I saw him was in a casket and it was being lowered into the ground. Being lowered in the ground with my dreams of knowing him. With my dreams of healing our relationship. With my dreams. With all the answers of why I wasn't good enough right. for his attention and his love. It all went in the ground and I had to work it out on my own. That took years. He died when I was 14. Years. It took, I was in my 30s before I shook it. I was in my 30s when I realized I had been uh, highly successful as an athlete, highly successful as a business owner. Uh, everything I touched, I was just putting everything I had into it. I mean, I just would go all out. And I didn't realize until I was 36 years old that I was still trying to prove to my dead dad that I deserved his attention. Right. That's how powerful this is. Yeah. And I said, my kids will, I don't care how bad the relationship get. Me and my kids, my older kids, we, we have, you know, a couple of them, not all of them, some of them, like my oldest, just a jewel. Nothing but joy and, and everything. I love it to death. You know, but I have a couple that done got kind of sassy with me, and it only happened once. But it, and even then, I was there. I told them, do your thing. But when you need me, pick up the phone. I'll be there. There's not a child of mine that can say they reach out to me and can't have me. And the kids that I've reared that are not biologically mine have never had it mentioned right. in their face. Right. I 
take on the responsibility of loving her kids as if they're my own um, headache and love, uh, all the stuff, the good and the bad. <laughs> it all comes. I don't treat them no differently. I give them all of me every single day, mm -hmm. the adults and the kids that we have in the house. We got grandkids in here running around now. And the, and the chief ain't here today. The chief grandkid, he the youngest. He the boss is That's out so of the mall. We got a total of nine grandkids. Yes. And the youngest one just turned two, going on 25. And he think he run everything in the house. Y'all probably met him because he'll come jump up while I'm doing a live and just jump up there and take over the, uh, take over the stream. Mm -hmm. But there's no difference in it. But I was reared by my great-grandparents. And I learned probably when I was about 12 that my great-grandmother wasn't even my biological great-grandmother. My real great-grandmother died after she gave birth to my grandmother. My great-grandmother that I knew reared her, reared her siblings, turned around, reared my mama, and then reared me. Mm -hmm. And she never showed a difference. That woman loved me like I can only wish that other kids would be loved. And so that she instilled in me. And the one thing she told me, and then I'm done, I'll let, let Mary, and she, Mary and shut it down. She told me, son, when you meet a woman and she has children, that's a package deal. Yeah. If you can't handle it, don't step into it. If you step into it, give it everything you've got. Do not show difference between what is and what is not yours because the moment you take her, you take the kids too. It's a package deal. And that's how I've tried to love my wife and love our kids. And we have got to do a better job. So we are going to ask you guys to support the work we're doing with Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, dealing with the girls, mm -hmm. and Black Men Lead, dealing with the boys from 4 to 30. And uh, I'm going to leave it with you. What do you want to share? How do you well, want to close what I this wanted, out? I wanted us to do it together, but what do you think we could do as a collective to change the numbers, because like you say, the numbers, you know, we have this big gap. Right. How, well, how do we change those numbers about single parent households? Again, it goes back to something that I say in both books, something that I say when I speak, something that I've shared with you guys before. We need men and women who are committed to this that are willing to plant seeds that they may not live long enough to see come to fruition. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can't reverse 40 years of something disintegrating in one failed swoop. You've got to sit up and say, okay, this generation is going to get a dose of what true manhood is and what true womanhood is. And we're going to teach it to them as young children. And what we've got to do is we've got to understand that we've got a generation now between 18 and 35 that are just totally out there lost. They don't want to yeah. do nothing. They are geniuses. The things that they can do with their mind, the things that they understand about technology, the things that they're doing, they're gifted with in the music industry in so many ways, but they don't want to put a foot forward. They don't, want, they are entitled mm -hmm. and they just want to sit around and do nothing. And it's our fault because mm -hmm. we were busy out doing our thing while single parents were raising kids. And see, I was a single parent. Mm -hmm. See, I reared mine. I had mine. But, and, and, and still... With a man present, the woman's not present, that's still a problem. Still an issue. And so what happens is we sent these kids out half prepared. prepared. And so what we've got to do is actually start a process through programs like the ones we're talking about, but as with others as well, we've got to start a process in which we are grooming and socializing babies mm -hmm. that may not be in... Uh, dual parent homes, but we've got to give them exposure to both masculine and feminine energy. We've got to model manhood, model womanhood. We've got to show them positive we've got to relationships show them, between men and women. Right. We've got to show them how to interact with one another. We've got to teach boys. One of the number one rule in black man lead, the first principle of black manhood is that the black man never does harm to a black woman. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, psychologically, or physically. Never does anything Harmful to, a, harmful to a woman. So that's the work, first rule. So that's the first thing we teach boys. That your responsibility is to make sure she's safe. 
not be a part of the problem, but be the solution to the problem. And then we teach the young girls to first of all, understand the value of yourself. And when I teach young girls about worth, I say, I hear you talking about how, 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 how much you're worth. I hear you talking about your value, but you ought to understand something. Your value isn't what you say it is. Your value is what you're willing to accept from others. If you accept a boy talking to you, out of your, calling you out of your name, that's your value. If you accept a boy putting his hands on you, that's your value. If you give yourself to a boy without him having committed to you and having something laid out for you to tell you how he's going to take care of you for, for the long term, that's your value. It's not what you say, it's what you accept. I can tell you my car is worth 100000 but if I take 50 for it, it wouldn't work for 50 mm -hmm. If it's worth something, that's why uh, in dealing with high-end cars, you go into a high-end dealership, if that's a $175,000 price tag on it, you're paying $175,000. You know, you may get $5,000 here for a cash if you're paying cash. Yeah. You may get a, a little extra for cutting all the bull crap out from financing. They'll give you a cash deal. I know this. They'll give you a cash deal, but they you're not you're not gonna get twenty thousand off, thirty thousand right. off. No, right. you're gonna pay it because if this is the kind of car you want, you can afford it. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford it, this ain't the car you want. You want a deal? You need to go where they give you ten thousand dollar rebates. Yeah, and stuff like that. But if you want a you want this, you're gonna pay this for it. That's the value setting. That's how you establish value by saying I will accept nothing. Sorry about that. It, it we're about crazy. to close off because it gonna seems like up. we're getting busy. Yeah, every, everything's <laughs> going crazy. But uh, with that being said, look, we're about to get off of here. We want to thank everybody. We want to thank you for taking the time to spend as much time as you have with us. We hope that we will uh, join you. Like I said, we decided to sit in another room in the house. Uh, actually, it's kind of like our little personal space. Uh, I spend a lot of time down here, but this this is kind of our little personal space. Uh, we decided to share it with you instead of doing it in the office uh, because it gives us more room to fit into the uh, frame of the camera. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties, <laughs> lights going off, doorbell ringing. Uh, it's so much that just happened. But at the same time, I think that we got our point across. We need your support. Um, and uh, we need uh, your blessings. Uh, go follow Mar Marion. I'm going to make sure I put that in the description box. Go find Marion at her uh, YouTube channel, uh, Restoring Ghettos Forgotten Daughters, where she's focus focusing specifically on uh, areas of love and concern for our babies. Uh, and when I say babies, I'm talking our young, our young females from four up to 30. Uh, yeah. I mean, to me, those are all babies from where I'm concerned because I got kids. Old. We both got kids older than that. So, um, man, we got kids in our in their thirties. Wow! Uh, but oh, and, and and show a little extra love for your support this week. This is my birthday, birthday week. Saturday, right. I will be fifty three years old. Mm -hmm. um, and we have gone through a lot in the last few years with my health. Uh, so to be sitting here at fifty three and saying uh, I'm looking forward to another fifty. Um, feels good because it was a time where it was Fred and I was really concerned about her uh, because she lost her mom through a heart attack and she had to stand there and watch me suffer multiple heart attacks uh, and it wasn't easy and so I asked God to give me another chance to sh make sure that she's okay and uh, he did so here I am um, on that note we're gonna get out but show your love go to the description box Click that but uh, click the link if you want to go to the site and give. Give via uh, Cash App if you decide to. Uh, send some uh, love and light through emails. Uh, let Marion know what y'all always telling me about <laughs> Marion. Uh, go to her page and let her know you mad crazy about what she does and how she does it. And, the, and I'm gonna try to get on there more. But just so you guys know, I'm so I'm such a behind the scenes type oh, person. Man. So I do a lot of work, but I do it behind the scene. And and most of the work that I did with the young women that I work with is because it was at the jail system. There was no cameras, cameras. allowed. There was no you can't right. talk about any of that. So I'm just just that behind the scene type person. But I'm trying to get out there. 
But if you don't see me on camera as much as you see him, because this is what he does for a living or whatever, I, I have other businesses. I'm a realtor. I have my real estate business and I have a tax business. And then I have my ministry part with restoring ghettos for God and daughters. Then I have all these children and grandchildren. So I'm extremely busy, but I'm willing to give part of myself to the YouTube channel just so that I can reach more people. So yeah. show your love, I, yeah. go on my page and subscribe. I really appreciate when, it. When, when she says we got all these children, let me, let me clarify. <laughs> we got 13 kids. Yes in this blended family. And like I said, there's no difference. So there we have no 13 kids from 35 to six. We love them all. And then we have nine grandkids and they think they live here. So we need y'all. So, so. so we need y'all prayers, please. <laughs> yeah. So we can make it through. Right. So again, thank you everybody. <laughs> really appreciate you guys showing up. I'm gonna get off of here. Uh, Marion, thanks you as well. Thank and we'll you. talk to you soon. We're out of here. Bye. Bye-bye.